once we know what the causes are, we've talked about the basic pathophysiology. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of hypoxia. So I'm going to go back a little bit now to the whole concept of the lung. So we talked about the lung as a balloon. Well, let's forget that for a second. I'm assuming you're all sitting on a level ground in your living rooms, in a hospital or at home. And what you're doing is probably breathing in air in and out. So when you're breathing in air, you're breathing air which is surrounding you now obviously i've taken off my mask i'm in the hospital setting i took off the mask because i need to talk to you and the mask is off and air goes into my nose and mouth and as you know the air composition is 21 percent oxygen and the rest is nitrogen and inert gases now this 21 percent oxygen is at a certain pressure in the mouth area depending on where you are on the surface of the earth if you're on top of mount everest or in an aeroplane which is not pressurized your pressure of air is going to be less there but as you keep coming down Imagine a column of air sitting on top of you. So that column of air is the atmospheric pressure. And that atmospheric pressure is the weight of the atmosphere sitting on top of you. And that is the weight of the air sitting on top of you. And that is 760 millimeters of mercury. And when you have 760 millimeters of mercury, you would realize that 21% of that 760 millimeters of mercury is actually, so let's see, 760 millimeters of mercury and 21% of that is 0 0.21. And if you had a fast brain, you're going to tell me that this answer is about 150. So that is the actual millimeters of mercury of air oxygen actually at your mouth. However, you all know that the PO2 in your blood is not usually 150. When you're breathing room air, that number keeps coming down. And that comes down because of absorption to water vapor in your air passages and the role of carbon dioxide and the respiratory quotient. So the respiratory quotient, the exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide, so that number ends up coming to about 100. So your alveolus on a normal good day, breathing a healthy lung is going to be seeing 100 millimeters of mercury. Stepping back a second here. So suppose somebody has a low PO2 or a low oxygen. So the PO2 is measured low. It is less than 100, say it's 40, 50, something of that sort. You need to figure out why. Now, you may get this also through a measurement called an oxygen saturation. And I'm assuming many of you know what that is. An oxygen saturation is actually the measurement of your oxygen level on your finger. So I have a saturation probe here with me. So if I put it on my finger, so you're going to just check and I'm putting it on my finger. And if I look at it here, you can actually see it right, I think, over here. And I guess my heart is beating. You can see the waveform come up there and slowly it's going to show it is 97%, so 98%. So what does that 98% really mean? It means that 98% of the red blood cells in my bloodstream are 98% saturated with oxygen. If you remember your physiology classes, many of us don't, I know it's early on in med school and you don't remember everything, but you have a hemoglobin molecule, there's heme, with the iron, then you have the four globin molecules and they attach the oxygen. So there's a principle called cooperativity where one oxygen molecule attaches to the hemoglobin molecule. Then the affinity for the next oxygen increases further to two oxygens, then the third one and the fourth one. And that is a principle of cooperativity where the oxygen molecules stick to the hemoglobin. They run around your red blood cell and you realize that your saturation is what you measure on the fingertip is actually the saturation of oxygen in the bloodstream. You may have read on your numerous WhatsApp forwards you're getting that very recently the inventor of the uh, pulse oximeter, he's a Japanese gentleman who passed away recently, and he actually uh, invented this using a very interesting technique. It's like using radar Doppler. Essentially, the pulse oximeter is sending some red color infrared light in two wavelengths. It's bouncing off your red blood cells, and there's a computerized algorithm that calculates the time difference between coming from an oxygenated blood red blood cell and a non-oxygenated red blood cell, and the calculation tells you what is the percentage. Stepping back, so somebody has a low PO2, which usually translates to a low saturation. Then you need to get a history from the patient. Is this something that happened acutely, very quickly? Or is this something that's been happening for a while and it's a long-term problem? Or is this somebody with a known old problem that suddenly becomes acute? So an acute problem could be something like a pneumothorax, somebody with pulmonary embolism where the blood flow to the lungs stopped because of a clot. It can be somebody with congestive heart failure or asthma. It can also be somebody who had an aspiration event and suddenly the oxygen level dropped. It can also happen if somebody is in a pressurized environment and suddenly they depressurized, say in an aeroplane, for example, and the oxygen level dropped. It can be chronic. 
there are many patients with chronic obstructive lung disease or pulmonary hypertension or interstitial lung disease, as well as neuromuscular diseases who can't breathe easily, who have long-term problems which lead to low oxygen. Some of them may also lead to high, like a high carbon dioxide. We'll touch that base of that very shortly. Many of them may have an acute exacerbation of the old problem. So this may be somebody with an acute exacerbation of COPD. It might also be somebody with an exacerbation of interstitial lung disease or an exacerbation of their pre-existing pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is a high pressure on the right side of the heart usually. So once you have the situation, your goal of care is to triage them to see what exactly is the cause of their problem? And can I get away with just giving oxygen supplementation from outside to allow the low oxygen to be taken care of? Or do I need to put a machine either on the face or with a high flow oxygen or through a tube in the throat with a ventilator to actually deliver the oxygen into the lungs because they're not able to do it? And here we will talk about several concepts like peep, auto peep, recruitment, positioning, proning, things of that sort. Once this is done, you need to figure out what are the other things to do for this patient on a ventilator. For example, nutrition, avoiding fluid overload, making sure that they're not getting the secondary infections, making sure that they have blood clot prevention, doing a mouth cleaning with, say, chlorhexidine to prevent the ventilator-associated pneumonia, as well as making sure that they are on stress ulcer prophylaxis to prevent ulcers in the stomach. So these are some of the principles of critical care. And we'll kind of touch base with this another time. But right now, so far, we have summarized what happens to the air getting into your lungs. Now, going back to the definitions, which we discussed earlier, the PaO2 is the dissolved oxygen in plasma, and it can be between 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Remember, some of these units are in millimeters of mercury. When you're talking about the ventilator, we'll be talking about centimeters of water pressure. So SaO2 is a percentage of available oxygen bound to hemoglobin, and a normal range is 95 to 100. We checked mine, it was about 98%. Almost 98% of the oxygen available for tissue delivery is bound to the hemoglobin and with the remaining 2% is dissolved in the blood plasma. So what I would suggest is, so almost all of us have a normal lung structure, will have a normal saturation if you're getting adequate oxygen from outside. So almost 98% of oxygen available for tissue delivery is bound to hemoglobin and only a small percentage is dissolved in the blood plasma. And the SpO2, which we measure on the finger, is the saturation on the finger. It is a non-invasive measure of the saturation in the blood. So when you do an A arterial blood gas, you will get all these readings. You'll get the pH, PO2, PCO2, bicarbonate, and you will also end up getting the SpO2, which is the SaO2 in the blood, and SpO2 in the skin. This is the curve that I talked about earlier, and this is the shape of the curve, and essentially, what is the relevance to mechanical ventilation? Well, if your curve shifts to the right, again, going back to physiology, essentially it means the oxygen is more easily available. So for the same saturation, saturation is how much oxygen your hemoglobin is connected to, say it's 85% or 90%. If you kind of trace that, I'm you know, going to draw on this. Let's see here. So when you do 90%, so this is equal to a PO2 of about 50. If the curve moves, it is 60. And if the curve moves even more, it comes up to being about 70 plus. So essentially, as your curve moves to the right, your oxyhemoglobin saturation is, say, 90%. The same number, 90%, may be a PO2 of 50, 60, or 70, depending on where this curve is. And what this curve really says is the affinity of the hemoglobin molecules for oxygen. And this is the affinity of the molecule to connect the oxygen molecules. If you look there, if the pH decreases, meaning the blood becomes more acidic, suppose the temperature goes up, the curve shifts to the right. It allows the oxygen molecules to get released more easily. And this is what happens when somebody has sepsis or septic shock, where the heart rate is fast, they have a fever, and the body knows that you need more oxygen in that setting, and it releases it more easily. So a right shift, the oxygen is more available. A plateau, so this is where, let me show you the plateau here. This is the plateau where, if you can see, the PO2 can range between, say, 70 all the way to 100, 200, 300, actually. And for all of those, the saturation will still remain 95 to 100. That's because you reach the slope of the curve to be flat. So whatever increase you make in the oxygenation, your PO2 will keep going up, but your saturation will not go beyond, obviously, 
This is where the pulmonary capillaries are, which are carrying the oxygen. If you look at the steep slope, which is over here, this is the part that is steep, where there's a quick change in the oxygen level, the PO2 increases and the saturation goes up tremendously. And that happens where you have the systemic capillaries, meaning the blood supply coming of the aorta, for example. These are the ones where the oxygen is released and which is why the PO2 very quickly keeps going up. All of this is related to the concept we talked about earlier of cooperativity, where one oxygen molecule triggers the next oxygen molecule to have an increase in the saturation. 